Latino punk scene in the early 90s, that's 91, 92, 93, that time, it really exploded because all of a sudden we had a hell of a lot to sing about. What started happening politically in the U.S pissed us off so much and we were feeling targeted and we were feeling cornered as a community that we began to write songs about it. no such thing as punk, I think, in Pilsen. I mean, where I grew up, there was nothing like that at all. Being a young person in Pilsen at that time pretty much meant that you were on your own. You always had gangbangers around, and they always had their arms open for any kid, right? But if you weren't into that or didn't want to be a part of that, you pretty much had to come up with things to do on your own. When I was in fifth grade, I went um, to New York with my family as kind of like a vacation to visit some cousins. I remember flipping through their records and finding, you know, Clash album, Ramones, The Runaways, The Sex Pistols album, stuff like that. And my cousin had pictures of, you know, punks and stuff. And I was like, I want to get into that someday. <laughs> Around the same time that I went to New York in the late 70s, there was a scene that was also going on in Los Angeles that had a lot of Latinos and Chicanos who were involved. In 1976, if you had green hair, you know, or blue hair, or if you have, you know, wearing safety and outfits, you wouldn't fit into the mainstream of any of those scenes. The punk scene, I think, was really like melting pot. We never went to see the Zeros thinking it's like, it's a Latino band. We just thought, they're the Zeros. How much you were willing to come away from the mainstream was more of a, it was sort of the glue that was holding everyone together. <laughs> Probably actually any cell, I'm sorry, at this place called the Vex. And uh, we played a show there with the plugs and Los Amigos. And it was like this big, uh, kind of like an East LA type of thing where they were getting artists and musicians and trying to get them together for like this group show. And it was like artwork and it was poetry. People would read between, um, between bands. And then that was kind of like the foundation of the whole East LA. The renaissance they called it i never heard about the east l.a renaissance i didn't even hear about it until recently 
I mean, I had thought there might have been some type of old East L.A. scene. I just wasn't really that sure about it until I started asking questions. People don't really know enough about what happened before. There was never really uh, anything that's really marked that people can refer to and say, oh, this is what was going on before us. It's kind of this really scattered bits and pieces of history and of, of bands or songs, but nothing that was ever, it seems like, really well documented that people could say, oh, okay, this is what happened prior to us. It was around 1986 when I heard for the first time of bands coming out of Latin America. I remember hearing this excellent song from an old band from Argentina. And I remember hearing it going, this is from Argentina? There was actually scenes going on in Latin America, which for me made a connection because of where we're from. And I started saying, this is amazing. And it had this urgency and this, I mean, it was pissed. <laughs> wasn't this kind of like thing that I was used to seeing in Chicago where it seemed like bands were singing about things that they, they didn't have shit to do with, you know? I mean, they were talking about anti-war stuff when, you know, they're living in some cushy-ass suburb. <laughs> what the fuck do you know about war? In Latin America, they're singing about poverty because they are poor. It's, and it's a totally, totally different situation, and it comes off as being a lot more sincere and honest, totally honest. Being involved in the hardcore community or scene, whatever, um, I always felt like, you know, there was a lot of stuff missing that I couldn't, you know, either I couldn't relate to or some other people couldn't relate to me. I felt like an outsider in everything. notorious for saying racism sucks, but when it comes down to having friends of color, it's cool until they open their big mouths.
Bueno, ¿por qué ese sonido? Porque también es una forma de, de salir de lo, de lo habitual, de lo cotidiano. Porque es una forma de, de mostrar ese coraje, esa rabia que el sistema nos ha, nos ha metido en una forma como a escondidas. Tal vez la sociedad no lo siente así, pero yo lo siento porque lo, 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 lo vivo y digo, bueno, pero ¿por qué, voy, ¿por qué voy a estar aceptando esto si no es justo? No, es, no, 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 no puede ser posible que yo esté trabajando 50 horas por, por 5 dólares. Chicano, latino, kids and punk rock, like, we also have to deal with our families and other things in our communities that might not affect other kids in the punk community. I decided to do my band, I said, I want to put what is our experience, because I don't come from Schaumburg, you know what I'm saying? I was living in Pilsen, so I just wanted to write songs with my band that was about what we were dealing with, and we made a conscious decision to sing in Spanish, because all our lives we've been told, you can't do this or you shouldn't do this, and we said, fuck it, you know, we're gonna do it, and we did. I was excited by your music, you know, really excited by it. Why? <laughs> Well, you know, the things you were saying, you know, you don't hear those in mainstream bands, and sure, punk bands say them, but not in Spanish. And when you do it in Spanish, you're getting some ears, and you're pricking up some ears that wouldn't have been turned in before. It's not simply talking in Spanish, you're targeting them. And um, Latinos and Spanish-speaking people are used to being targeted in other ways, whether it be violence, exploitation, or as a demographic for marketing marketing groups, right? But when you target them, when you target the Latino community to um, have, a, have a conversation with them, to guess what? You're not alone, you know? We're not usually welcome anywhere. You know, even in your own community, who's shooting who, right? Or where are you really welcome? Where are you really welcome, you know? un grupo que se llama Contraataque de Los Ángeles cantan muchas bueno sus letras son principalmente de los inmigrantes indocumentados y, y, y o sea eh, cantan como historias no de, de las personas eh, los problemas que tienen para pasar la frontera a los problemas que te enfrentas ya estando aquí y sí me siento identificada un poco esa música su su volumen todo su todo el ruido que sale de ahí no es nada más ruido, sino es todo un sentimiento que está saliendo y que está tratando de, de llegar a, a, pues a esa demás comunidad. with Proposition 187, the NAFTA, what started happening in Mexico with the uprising of the Zapatista movement. I mean, and just the general, like, xenophobia that was existing in the U.S. I mean, whatever city you were coming from, because it wasn't just a West Coast thing, it was in Texas, it was in the Midwest, wherever you were going, we were being faced with these issues. And all of a sudden, 
there was a lot to sing about, a lot to write about, a lot to talk about. Here they were, these um, kids singing in Spanish in San Diego, all these places where people are like fearing that of the brown invasion, of, like all these immigrants coming in. And like here, these kids were not only singing radical politics and saying things that affected their community, but they were doing it in Spanish. into the communities we come from. We have an enormous um, world. It's a universal um, network that exists. And it's the DIY network, which is the most powerful thing that has come out of punk, I think, ever. And I don't know of any other music scene or genre that runs the way we do it. It means having control, total control of what it is you do, what it is you write, how you want to write it, how you want to put it out there and distribute it, releasing our own records, making our own shirts, anything. I mean, everything is DIY, even down to the, the way that we book our shows. We don't run in a club circuit. We don't run through promoters. I mean, it's all done on the bands under our terms and, on, and just on our own. People with other interests, monetary interests, to come in and strip down, water down, co-opt what we're doing, taking the anger and the pissed offness away from us, and it works. Tratas de expandir la definición, tratas de controlar tu vida en una sociedad donde estás completamente controlado por la sociedad, controlado por el, el sistema económico y político en el que vives. Y tratas de hacerlo tú mismo, tratas de, 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 de tratar de controlar tu vida. That's why we said DIY, uh, uh, you're being so sufficient and, and, and have your own direction and control. Uh, and I think uh, what we're finding in society is how we don't have that type of control for uh, directions of our lives, where it's going to, why it seems more like someone else has control of how we're brought up and raised and, and, uh, and why, uh, you know, there's these class systems of racism and all these other things. That's probably the, the best way to fight back to me, just throw it in your fucking faces, you know, just be like, look, motherfuckers, I don't need you. Simple as that.
for a lot of the Latino bands started becoming sort of like a spoken word. It wasn't just like, you know, the bands getting up there and rocking out. It was more about um, talking and having this kind of dialogue with people. And sometimes the crowd would get into it. And the shows almost started becoming like this open forum to discuss. We ride, we wrote this song. That's right, motherfuckers, we are that speak band. It's because there were people who involved and said in this music scene or whatever, refer to Los Crudos as a spit band. Oh yeah, a spit band. Oh yeah, but Martin's cool. No. That's, that's what was said. Oh yeah, that's spit band, but Martin's a cool guy. No, fuck you, I'm not a cool guy. Uh, you refer to me as a spit, and you refer to me as a that tells those type of jokes. You are a fucking part of the problem, okay? But it also lets us know that what we've been doing for so many years is right, okay? And it's like, I, or anybody in this band, ever since we started this band, and the kids that have been coming to see us from this neighborhood since we started this band, none of us, none of us feel less than anybody else. The way we were born, the language we speak, the foods we eat, what we're about, about our history, about our families, there's no shame. So things like that, piss us off so bad. Um, <laughs> this song, I wanted to write it so bad when I got it down. So we're doing this song, this guy's it's English. And I want other English to understand. <laughs> I don't understand because uh, it's really frustrating. And, um, esta canción la dedico a toda la gente de este barrio, de nuestros amigos, de nuestros compas. Ay, 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 sake it's like the stuff that is really important to us and we need to build a whole culture of resistance and punk rock to me and hardcore is a part of that didn't mean letting go of these ties that we had to to our parents or to our family or to where we're from or to our language. It didn't mean breaking away from that. It meant working with them to try to get somewhere, to get to a new level.
ob objectives of the school is that we would hope that other young kids would start to sing about things and to start to have and give themselves that voice, that ability to start speaking out. And I've recently been finding new bands for my person in Chicago. It's kids, 16, 17 year old kids picking up guitars and, and instruments and just you know, letting loose and venting, you know, and getting all that out there.